I'll do a little bit of housekeeping too while we're at it. Um, and on the back chairs, there are three piles. One is that I'm going to be um, having a Tolkien conference in 2018, November 2018, at Valparaiso University. It's going to be huge, four days. We've got Johann de Meij, some of you may know him as the composer of the Lord of the Rings Symphony Number no. 1. He has been commissioned to write another uh, musical work, 45 minutes, for this conference. And so um, he's going to be premiering it at that conference. Um, Simon Tolkien, the grandson of J.R.R., is going to be there to sign some of his novels. I'm also trying to get other <coughs> keynote speakers at this time, so there's a piece of paper back there um, for, to find out more about that. Um, I'm also doing a GoFundMe, a GoFundMe for, to pay uh, Johan de Mage for the commissioning of the work. So I would hope that those of you who are here will take that sheet of paper and hopefully spread it around uh, internationally, um, trying to raise $50,000 to pay him for this. So, and if you give 250 or more, your name will be indelibly linked to this commission because your name will be listed in the program notes uh, when it's premiered. The other is that there's a card back there for the Journal of Token Research, of which I'm the editor. We have three editorial board members here, uh, Dimitra, and uh, Andrew Higgins, and Christine Larson, uh, and I'm the editor. And for those of you who are presenting, there are three ways for you to publish in the journal. We have number one conference papers, which is just like this. All you need to do is upload your conference paper, and it's available uh, to everyone, the slides and everything. We have um, editor review, uh, which means that I would review it, and if it seems um, uh, permissible, then I will upload it, and then we also have peer review. So we have three ways that you can publish, whichever way you're interested in, but I'm trying to, this is open access peer reviewed journal, so there are many different ways that you can contribute, right? Uh, a little bit different from the print traditional. So sorry for all of that, but all of that is in the back of the room. If you're interested in, you can talk to me anytime today. So in examining Tolkien's poetic works, it becomes apparent that the use of musical illusion and musical language are parts of his literary toolkit for expression and meaning. Writers on Tolkien's literary style and historical background have documented and commented on many of these illusions. Berlin Flieger, for instance, makes specific mention of Owen Barfield's viewpoints on the relationship between the poet and God in the creation of words and meaning in his book, Poetic Diction, which had been read and was well known to Tolkien. Quote, both Tolkien and Barfield regard the word as the instrument of creation, and words as instruments of humanity's separation from God and from the universe, as well as indices and measurements of that separation. Both felt that the task of the poet was to bridge that separation, to use words to reconnect what they had suffered. For each of them, words were, be to, were to be the poetic instruments of humankind's ultimate and conscious reunion with God. Poetic diction makes it clear that it is in and by words that we feel and express a sense of separation, and that it will be through the creative power of words that we can return. The poet, through the use of metaphor, is a maker of meaning and a recreator of perception. Poetry, poetic diction, reinvests the world with meaning and rebuilds our relationship with it. This is splintered light, endlessly combined. That mythical grammar by which the sub-creator may assist in the effoliation and multiple enrichment of creation. So that's from Berlin Flieger's book, Splintered Light. It is not known whether Tolkien read or knew of the writings and philosophy of Jacques Maritain, who lived from 1882 to 1973. But we do know that Charles Williams reviewed a number of his books. Stratford Caldicott, a well-known author on the theological and spiritual influences on Tolkien, discusses Maritain's philosophy regarding ethics, the arts, and the role of the unconscious in one of his books on Tolkien. So here's a quote from Maritain. This, thus it is that we must recognize the existence of an unconscious or pre-conscious which pertains to the spiritual powers of the human soul and to the inner abyss of personal freedom and of the personal thirst and striving for knowing and seeing, grasping and expressing, a spiritual or musical unconsciousness which is specifically different from the automatic or deaf unconscious. And then Caldicott quotes, the spiritual or musical unconsciousness, on the other hand, is the seedbed of poetic knowledge and creative intuition. I have also written about Tolkien's literary influences, particularly Victorian predilection for musical illusion in both prose and poetic writings. 
In fact, I have done some rather simple and clumsy attempts at digital text analysis of various poetic works of Victorian writers for musical illusions, which have produced some interesting preliminary results that might offer some tantalizing future research opportunities. Once better digital access and analysis tools can be applied to both the Victorian and the Tolkien oeuvre. In the absence of these at this time, Google Scholar has digitized quite a few of the Victorian literary poetic influences on Tolkien, and some of Tolkien's own opus can be analyzed in full text as well, although not in accessible in its entirety due to copyright restrictions. This, will, this uh, presentation will describe some of the results of this basic and clumsy textual analysis in the hopes that it will spur further research and perhaps eventual full text digital access to these works for richer comparison and data analysis. There are a number of Tolkien poetic works whose influence on Tolkien's writing style are available full text through Google Scholar. These include the Kalevala, which is not Victorian, but included here because of its influence on Tolkien, William Morris's Earthly Paradise, Tennyson's Idols of the King, Swinburne's Tale of Balan, the Poetic Ada, Volume 1, again, not Victorian, but included here because of its influence on Tolkien, and Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse. For Tolkien, the poems in the Lays of Beleriand are available in Google Scholar, and the entire book can be searched by keywords, but only pages 1 through 127 can be viewed due to copyright restrictions. I wanted to get an idea of how many musical illusions were contained in the above works and see if some type of preliminary analysis might show some interesting relationships and connections. A standardized list of 28 words associated with music were developed and searched on all of the works I mentioned previously. The list is provided here, so you can look at that quickly. One of the interesting issues related to keyword searching on Google Scholar is that it does exact searching. Thus, words such as chant, chanted, and chanting had to be searched separately, as they would not appear unless entered exactly. The results for the Victorian writers and the musical words in their poems I'm going to show you now for each of the books I listed. So, here are those lists of musical references in regards to the Kalevala. You can see that um, there's quite a few of them in there. And in fact, this is uh, one which has uh, the most. In fact, minstrel is listed 56 times, as you can see. Um, singing, 35, song 16, etc., etc. So I think this kind of shows that music, music uh, words associated with music are quite extensive in the Kalevala. If we look at those same words from William Morris's Earthly Paradise, you can see that, um, again, all of these words are used. So it's pretty amazing. Um, many of them are used multiple times. Um, as you can see, even the opening, the first line, of heaven or hell, I have no power to sing, uh, is there. So again, lots of musical illusion. If we look at Tennyson's Idols of the King, you can see, again, not as big as the last one, but again, um, Especially song is used 11 times, sang six times, sung two times. So you can see I have to put in all of these different words because they won't, they won't find their declensions. If we look at Swinburne's Tale of Balaam, again, you can see that the, the word song, sung, and sing and music are used extensively. And then moving to the uh, Poetic Ada. Again, the word song, song, harp, horn, songs. Finally, Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse. So as can be seen by these clumsy analyses, there's quite a few differences just in the amount and use of these musical terms in the Victorian and other literature referenced above. This doesn't even take into account many other musical terms such as dancing and bard, which appear throughout some of these works. I was trying to maintain a standardized list of musical terms <clears throat> and will leave overall comments until after the presentation 
of these musical words and Tol Tolkien's poetic words. For simplicity's sake, then, moving on to the Tolkien corpus, only the poems contained in the Lays of Valerian are analyzed here. Because the Lays of Valerian book contains not only multiple versions of poems, but also scholarly narrative and comments, it was difficult to search for the list of musical terms without first noting the division of the book into its poetic, searchable sections. These sections with page numbers are provided on the screen. So you can see, I looked at the Lay of the Children of Huron, as well as its later version, and then the Lay of Latham from 1925 to 31, and then the Lay of Latham recommenced. So the following screens illustrate the standardized list of musical words as they appear in the Lays of Valerian and its various poetic versions. So as you can see here in the Children of Huron, there are some musical allusions. Again, um, song and sung and its various uh, declensions and tenses are available. Uh, minstrels is used once, horn three times. When we get to the revised version of the Lay of Huron, you will see that there was definitely a difference in Tolkien's later version. Now this is very interesting, so I think this is something that can be looked at in the future in terms of research. So his early version of the Lay had much more music, musical terms in it than its, in its later version. Now, if we look at the Lay of Lathan, Wow, there's lots, lots of musical terms here, and this is from 1925 to 31, which as many of you know, was the period of time when he kind of got stuck in the 30s, the early 30s, and he wrote The Fall of Arthur. Um, he also wrote The Lay of Ultrun and Itrun, which was just published. So it was during this point in time that he kind of stopped on The Lay of Lathan, and the early version has lots of musical illusion. But what's interesting is that when he came back to it after this period of time, Look at the diminished use of musical illusion. So this is an interesting thing that I've found in my research on musical illusion in Tolkien, is that his, his early, early works that really focus on that musical illusion part, but as he revised and revisited some of his earlier writings, a lot of that musical illusion is missing. It's taken out. So again, um, this is something that I think um, interesting for research in the future. So analysis of this data. What does this data illustrate? Well, I think there are focal points that can be documented. It is truly difficult to do this type of rudimentary, rudimentary crude research without the use of more technology, the availability of crucial texts in digitized form, and the application of digital text analysis tools. In addition, other variables such as length of poems and the length of various unfinished versions, in the case of Tolkien's poems, also scramble and challenge any sort of common denominators and conclusions. There are some interesting observations that can be made about this data, however, that might help to guide and provide future direction for research. One, the vast use of musical illusion in the two large works, Kalevala and Earthly Paradise. Two, the use of the word song and its various declensions and tenses in all of these works is quite obvious. Three, Tolkien's Lay of Lathan, 1925-31, illustrates a closer connection to the larger poetic works in its use of musical illusion. But this may also be because the recommenced version is unfinished and begun later in Tolkien's life. And four, Tolkien's Lay of the Children of Huron follows the same thread of thought as provided in the previous comment, although smaller in scale. So in conclusion then, this preliminary analysis of musical illusion in the works of Victorian and other poetic literatures, as well as Tolkien's poetic works, is just that, a beginning. We know that some of the Victorian and other literatures analyzed here had a profound influence on Tolkien's development as a scholar and writer. Whether that influence translated into his own writings remains to be researched in more depth. What can be stated is that musical illusion is strong in both the Kalevala and William Morris's Earthly Paradise, two large substantial works that Tolkien is known to have read and indicated a strong preference towards. That other Victorian poetic writers such as Chesterton, Swinburne, and Tennyson had quite a bit of musical illusion in their poetic works only one of, of, of which, only one of each of their poems, which is crudely, crudely analyzed here, that Tolkien's Lay of Latham from 1925 to 31 stands out as indicative of the Victorian predilection towards musical illusion, 
and that the word song and its various declensions and tenses stands out in all the poetic works cited in this article. As Flieger mentions in Splintered Light, quote, some creative collaboration with creation, which for Tolkien was the poet's collaboration with God, was the acknowledged principle behind his, that is Tolkien's, creative effort, unquote. It is my hope that future research will be able to accomplish more detailed and constructive analyses that are currently available, currently not available, either with the text themselves or with the available technologies. Thank you. Yes. Me? Hello? Hi. No, back. I'm Jessica. Uh, I wrote an essay in the 2005 proceedings on William Morris's influence on Tolkien. If, do you have the 2005 proceedings? I do not, sorry. I hope Trevor will be able to. Mm -hmm. I'd love to look at it. See Trevor. Okay. I can, if you see me, I can send you an email of the longer version with the bibliography which is left out. Just note two things. Um, Valerian, it is well known, is it not? And Christopher, talking in the lazy, um, you know, the third volume, he, does, he says he doesn't know why Tolkien in, had Brusseliand in one version and changed it to Valerian, but it is surely well known that Tolkien was aware that Valerion was the ancient name for Cornwall, as named by Pythias the Greek and Milton in this, so he spliced Valerion into the end of Brusseliand. Presumably. Um, all this work is fascinating, but it's William Morris that I'm the one concerned with. There is a list of the William Morris books that Tolkien owned, uh, published. I got a private list, but um, Christopher gave a list to Richard Matthews in his book on fantasy. Hmm. Again, that's one you might look up. It's got a blue cover. Rampage. Well, he's got a list at the back that Christopher told him. Uh, Tolkien didn't own. I think the shortage of money and availability, he didn't own all the William Morris he would have liked to own. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, he had the three prizes, and he had the Roots of the Mountains and the Earth in Paradise, of course, but he didn't have everything, but, and he didn't particularly have the late romances, which I assume he read in Exeter College, but he just read them between times, but we do know there was only one romance on the list, and that was The Sundering Flood. Mm. And uh, again, I quoted my essay that the phrase, The Sundering Flood, occurs in the Lay of Ithia. So you might look that up, go all the way through. Excellent. But that is the title of um, one book of Romance and Morris that we know Tolkien owned. There you go. Thank you for those tweets. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Um, I'm studying the connection between uh, Tolkien and uh, André Breton, who is the founder of the Surrealist movement. You, in the beginning of your uh, wonderful speech, uh, you talked about the automatic writing, and uh, so Breton is the, the one who theorizes this uh, kind of uh, <laughs> strange writing. Can you tell me something more about this uh, uh, influence uh, have you found on, uh, on Breton and uh, on automatic I, you know, writing? I'm not sure, but um, I'm going to be giving a paper at the uh, Augsburg Tolkien Conference in October which is looking at various sub-creation themes that happened around the same time Tolkien developed his. And Marathon uh, is one. Um, we've got, uh, what I've discovered is that Francis Thompson, who was a strong influence on Tolkien, actually wrote a 10-page uh, essay on his idea of, of um, God and the writer, which is not published, but which I have a copy of, and I'm going to, trans I'm going to um, hopefully um, be able to decipher and, pre and present a little bit at this conference. Um, we, we know about college, um, but there are any number of other writers around the turn of the 20th century who talk in terms of very similar of Tolkien's concept of sub-creation, and Marathon as well had this idea of, of the poet and God as having this kind of relationship of creation and that kind of thing. So there, there seems to have been some kind of uh, movement around the end of the 19th to 20th centuries of trying to put down into writing this understanding of what the relationships of, of writing, whether it was poetic or prose, and, and how that was kind of um, uh, linked uh, and, and brought together. And I think that's one area of research. When we talk, for instance, at the uh, IMC Congress, which is coming up, uh, we have a session on the future of Tolkien studies. I think this is one area that, of, for, future, for, for future research is that I'm sure that some of these other sub-creationist tendencies or philosophies had some impact on Tolkien because they were all kind of floating around in the air in the early 20th century. And it would be very interesting to find out what some of those links are. And I think Marathon 
is, is one of them. Uh, Eric Dill translated his um, important book, and we know that, um, that Tolkien had links with, with, some of the, with some of those um, writers as well in that circle. Brad, just, just yes. an interesting point when you mentioned Eric Gill. There's an interesting connection, too, between Eric Gill and Mary Inkleden, Tolkien's cousin, because she was the artist that retired to Eric Gill's religious community in Ditchley. So there might be something there. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's very yeah. interesting to see something, and much of it is personal. See, that's, that's the thing, I think, if we really want to get down, down into the weeds of future Tolkien research, to see what kinds of influence he had. It, it, it is often personal, and I think we need to do a better job of documenting those personal connections and sharing them so that we can use them in the future. Pat, yeah. have you tried running the term searches using the Antitrust um, project like the query tool? Because using that one, it might be possible that you can, like there should be a semantical layer that allows you to query for synonyms or something. So yeah, so, so I, I'm, not, I'm not a data analysis mm -hmm. expert. Um, I used the simplest tool that was available to me, which is Google Scholar. Um, I know that Robin Reed, about three years ago, wanted to start what was called the Tolkien Corpus Project. She hasn't had any uptake on that. She's been very disappointed. She was trying to get people to help her to put up the, you know, the writing so that they could be searched textually and, and this kind of thing outside of the copyright restrictions, set up a database. But we have to do that. We have to do that manually as, as a scholarly community. She couldn't get any uptake on that, so that, that is the only way we're going to be able to do this type of textual analysis. We've got to find a way to do it outside of the copyright restrictions in a, in a database that can only be accessed by scholars. We can't, it can't be available to everyone. And so that's the, that's the, you know, that's the challenge for us as a community is how can we do this so that we can really take an in-depth look at things like words and text that Tolkien used and then try to link those up. And then we can use 3D visualization, for instance, to show connections. I think that would be really cool to do in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.